Frequently spending time in nature allows you to reduce the intake of medications. According to new research conducted by scientists from Finland, frequent spending time in green areas such as parks and gardens helps maintain not only physical but also mental health. People who regularly spend time in nature experience a wide range of health benefits, which translates into reduced medication use, not only for depression and hypertension, but also insomnia, anxiety and even asthma, research suggests. Scientists from the Finnish Institute of Health and Welfare, the University of Tampere in Finland and the University of Eastern Finland indicate that frequent exposure to nature helps reduce the use of mental health medications. Although causality cannot be demonstrated, this study suggests that visits to parks, gardens and other urban green spaces may reduce urban residents' use of medications for anxiety, insomnia, depression, hypertension and asthma. The method does not work if we only observe a green meadow or forest from the window. Leaving the house and spending time in nature is key. The study used data from about 6,000 Helsinki residents who take medications for conditions such as insomnia, anxiety, depression, high blood pressure and asthma. Study participants were asked about the medications they were taking, as well as how much, green and blue, i.e. natural spaces on land and near lakes, rivers and seas, spaces they could see from home, how often they observed these views and how often they spent time in them. Exposure to natural environments is thought to be beneficial to human health, but the evidence is inconsistent, the researchers write in their paper. The results and description of the research were published in the journal, Occupational and Environmental Medicine. The study results showed that compared to less than one visit a week to a park or garden, three or four visits were associated with a significant decrease in the need for medication. In total, a greater number of visits to green areas was associated with 33%. A decline in the use of mental health medications, 36%. A decrease in the use of blood pressure medications and 26%. Decrease in the case of asthma medications. In the case of at least five visits to green areas a week, these numbers change and are respectively 22%, 41%, and 24%. This correlation occurs regardless of household income, education of study participants, or their BMI body mass index. This finding is consistent with preliminary evidence highlighting the importance of actual use of green spaces in relation to mental health. It also suggests a positive effect on other health conditions, such as asthma and hypertension, the researchers write. The data are not sufficient to discover the causes of such relationships. It is also worth considering that people in better health have more opportunities and motivation to go outside. Despite this, scientists believe that these relationships should continue to be verified. Research also shows that simply sitting and contemplating nature through the window does not have the same impact on health as leaving the house and spending time surrounded by greenery. Previous research has shown that it doesn't take long for the effects of being outdoors to be felt. However, before people can go out and spend time in green spaces, they must be accessible. The growing body of scientific evidence showing the health benefits of exposure to nature is likely to increase the supply of high-quality green spaces in urban environments. This may be one of the ways to improve health and well-being in cities, say the scientists. Cryonics. The dream of immortality. 
Cryonics is viewed with skepticism in the scientific community and is widely considered a pseudoscience. But as the popular saying goes, a drowning man grasps at straws. Many terminally ill people decided to freeze their bodies in the hope that in the future medicine would be able to revive and heal them. Will it be so? We don't know. But it's impossible at the moment. Cryonics is based on the assumption that science will one day find solutions to many diseases that currently cannot be cured. For this purpose, the bodies of sick people are frozen and are to be kept that way until the necessary medical technology becomes available. However, cryonics is more faith than science and offers no guarantees that it will be successful. But as supporters of this method say, there is nothing to lose, and you can potentially gain a second life. Cryopreservation is the subject of much research. The condition in which cells, organs, or in rare cases entire organisms, can be cooled to extremely low temperatures and brought back to life intact occurs in nature, but only in limited cases. Tardigrades, for example, are capable of this. Scientists are trying to learn the secrets of this process in their research, but currently there is no technology that would allow freezing people and bringing them back to life. Freezing people was first proposed by Michigan State University professor Robert Ettinger. This physicist is better known not for his achievements in this field, but for the book published in 1962. The Prospect of Immortality he is considered the father of cryonics. In 1976, he founded the Cryonics Institute with three colleagues. This organization provides cryonics services and research related to improving cryopreservation techniques. The first attempts at freezing people were carried out in the 1960s. Not all of them were successful. Over the years, Companies offering similar services emerged and went bankrupt, and bodies were thawed and buried in cemeteries. The methods used in cryonics have also evolved. The early trials were quite gruesome. The capsules turned out to be unstable. And there were oversights and mistakes made by the people responsible for this process, which resulted in the thawing of the bodies. Ultimately, of all the bodies frozen before 1973, only one survived, the body of Robert Bedford, who was frozen in 1967. The family decided to take care of the body capsule on their own. The cryopreservation process begins after a person is declared dead. Blood and other fluids are removed from the body and replaced with chemicals designed to prevent harmful ice crystals from forming. Today, the vitrification method is used, but initially the bodies were hurriedly cooled on dry ice before finally being packed into liquid nitrogen capsules. Today it looks completely different. The bodies are prepared in a multi-stage process. First the body is cooled. Anticoagulants and organ preservation solutions are injected into the bloodstream and distributed throughout the body using a perfusion machine. The corpse is then subjected to the vitrification process, which is also called vitrification. The previously administered fluids are removed from the body and replaced with a cryoprotectant. Vitrification is the transition from a liquid state to a glassy state. It involves immediately lowering the temperature of the solution, cryoprotectant, to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, i.e. to minus 196 degrees Celsius. The use of vitrification offers some hope in reducing freezing damage because the process reduces the formation of ice crystals. Then the body goes to its capsule, where it will stay until it is thawed. There are two main cryonics organizations in the U.S. This is the previously mentioned Cryonics Institute, which stores over 200 bodies in giant tanks and accepts registrations from dozens of interested people every year. 
The second is the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, commonly referred to as Alcor itself, which holds a similar number of bodies. However, there are more companies and institutions of this type in the United States and around the world. There are several companies in the world engaged in this type of practice. However, there is a problem with the procedure, it can be implemented only when the doctor confirms death, otherwise it would be illegal and unethical. Brave people who undergo the procedure formally donate their bodies to medical experiments, said Katarzyna Nawanczyk Bozinska from the Adam Mikovich University in Poznan in an interview with PAP2. Years ago, the scientist also added that a neuropreservation procedure is also possible, which involves freezing only the head. In accordance with the principle that the brain is a key organ and the seat of our consciousness. The minimum cost, as reported by Reuters, is 200,000 Polish Swatis. Dollars for the body and $80,000 for the brain alone. In turn, the Big Think website reports that 10 years ago just storing the head in Alcor cost 80,000 Polish Swatis dollars, while storing the entire body at the Cryonics Institute cost 30,000 Polish Swatis dollars. There are also international options that may be cheaper. There is also a Russian company that offers cryopreservation not only for people, but also for pets. But what you pay for is not always what you get. There have been known cases in Alcor of reducing bodies to just heads. All this to cut costs because neuropreservation is cheaper. However, during the reduction, the thawing bodies were examined. While the bodies were still frozen, their skin was only moderately cracked in a few places. But as the bodies thawed, things started to get worse. The organs were ruptured, as was the spinal cord. To check the health of the blood vessels, a dye was injected into an artery in the arm. Instead of flowing through the blood vessels to the muscles, most of the dye accumulated under the surface of the skin in the pockets formed by the cracks and leaked out. Looking at the extensive damage to these bodies, doctors concluded that medicine in the future would have to be very advanced to cope with such damage. Because the probable destruction at the cellular level may require rebuilding the body at the molecular level. Perhaps future medicine will be able to inject swarms of nanobots into the body to repair every bit of tissue, but that certainly won't happen anytime soon. Does cryonics work? Not currently and unlikely to happen in the near future. Will there ever be? This is an open question. As we see it today, cryonics is a bizarre cross between scientific thinking and wishful thinking. But many have succumbed to this perception of reality. Famous people who underwent cryonics include famous baseball player Ted Williams or economist and entrepreneur Phil Salon. Walt Disney is often mentioned in this group, but it is known that the famous animator and film producer was cremated and buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery. Of course, the methods used today in such trials are much more advanced than in the early days of cryonics, but the laws of nature are inexorable. If in fact, medical technologies become sufficiently advanced in the future, perhaps frozen corpses will be resurrected. But there are too many ifs in this whole issue. Mysteries of Consciousness. Scientists propose a new explanation. A team of scientists from Boston University have proposed a new theory of consciousness. According to which our brains are not actually actively aware of our surroundings, but are instead processing subconscious memories formed only half a second earlier.
Researchers believe their new concept could explain why it is so difficult to resist temptation and impulsive behavior, as well as explain phenomena that cannot be explained in other ways. Consciousness is the basic mental state through which we are aware of internal phenomena, such as our thought processes and feelings, and phenomena occurring in the external environment. It is thanks to awareness that we can respond to various stimuli. It is subjective and unique to each person. Scientists at Boston University Chobanian and Avedisian School of Medicine recently developed a new theory about consciousness. It explains its development, shows what it is useful for, what disorders it can affect and why maintaining a strict diet or resisting urges is so difficult. In short, our theory is that consciousness evolved as a memory system that our brain uses unconsciously to help us flexibly and creatively imagine the future and plan accordingly, explains Professor. Neuroscience Andrew Budson, lead author of the study. According to her, we do not perceive the world, make decisions or perform actions directly. Instead, we do all these things unconsciously. And then, about half a second later, we consciously remember doing them, says the scientist. Budson emphasizes that he developed the new theory with philosopher Drive. Kenneth Richman of the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences and psychologist Dr. Elizabeth Kensinger of Boston College. Scientists wanted to explain a number of phenomena that could not be easily explained using previous theories of consciousness. We knew that the processes that influence consciousness in the brain were simply too slow for us to actively participate in dance, music, sports and other activities that require split-second reflexes. But if consciousness isn't involved in these processes, then a better explanation of what it does is needed, Budson says. The new concept suggests that all our decisions and actions are actually made unconsciously, even though we fool ourselves into thinking that we make them consciously. So we can tell ourselves that we are only going to eat one spoonful of ice cream. However, the next thing we know is that the container is empty. This happens because our conscious mind does not control our actions, the authors of the publication point out. Even our thoughts are generally not under conscious control. This lack of control means we may have difficulty stopping the stream of thoughts running through our heads when we're trying to sleep, Budson adds. Budson believes that a number of neurological, psychiatric and developmental disorders are disorders of consciousness, including Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, delirium, migraine, schizophrenia, dissociative disorder, some types of autism and others. The article contains tips for practitioners that can help in effectively shaping both the conscious mind and the unconscious brain. According to the authors, their work may in the future allow patients to improve problem behaviors such as overeating, help us understand the ways in which brain structures support memory, and even change our views on philosophical issues such as free will and moral responsibility.